Hello, Houston. I'm Rick Cashaw, a professor of psychology here at the University of Houston, and I'm going to be your instructor in this uh, Problems of Normal Life course. You can probably tell from my voice that I'm male, I hope, that I'm slightly nervous, <coughs> coughing already, which is a condition brought on by talking in front of people that you've never met before. And from my accent, you'd probably guess that I'm from somewhere in the Midwest, okay? So you've already begun to form some impressions of me. Um, and what I'd like to do is see how accurate you actually are in those impressions. So before you actually get to see me, I'm going to ask you several questions about me and allow you to, to make some guesses about, about what I will actually look like when we turn the picture on, uh, on me. Um, so let me challenge you to, to estimate the following before you actually see me. And that is, first of all, what would be your guess about my weight? How much do you think I weigh? A scant 130, and if I'm not facing the right direction, you can't even see me on the, on the, um, on the picture tube. Um, 170, 200, 230, or am I actually a widescreen vision of, of 325 or something like that? So make a guess about my weight. Just, just write in the margin of your notes there. I, there probably won't be a test item on this, so, so don't worry about that. But just an estimate of, of what you think this voice is attached to by way of a body. Secondly, how tall am I? What would you think my height would be, given the voice that, it's, that is attached to this body? 5'4", uh, standing on my sho shoes, standing uh, here in front of the uh, lectern, um, around six feet, or am I over tall? Six 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 seven. Make a guess based on, on that. Anything in between. I'm not giving you specific answers, just a range. Um, thirdly, how old do you think I am? Mid thirties, full of wisdom and certainty. Mid fifties, a little more questioning. Mid seventies, totally confused and oriented physically toward the lectern, just so that I can see which direction to be lecturing at the moment. So how how old do you think I am? Mid-30s, mid-50s, mid-80s, 120 and brought out of retirement to do this? Make a guess. Fourthly, what about my hair? Long or short? Light, dark, curly, straight? Make some guesses about my, some descriptions of, of what my hair looks like. And while you're at it, what is my race? Caucasian, black, pink, Yellow, blue, make a guess. What's my race? So what I've done there is to ask you to make a series of guesses. First of all, about my weight. How many pounds you think I am? Secondly, about my height. Thirdly, about my age. Fourthly, some descriptions about my hair, long or short, dark or light, and so forth. And finally, I was asking you to make a guess about my, um, my race. Now, all of this is, is essentially based on a series of things that you and I are constantly doing when we interact or choose to interact with each other. And that is we're making guesses about people, even based in many instances on remarkably little information. We make some major decisions about people just based on things like height and weight and race and, and what their voice sounds like, do they sound like they know what they're talking about, and so forth and so on. So we do a lot of stuff of the kind of that I've already asked you to do before we even decide whether to strike up a conversation with anybody, and that's kind of what I wanted to illustrate in this, um, in this particular opening. So if you're ready for the answers, um, let me see if I can give them to you here. So at this point, we will, um, we will cut to me uh, and show you what the answers actually look like. Um, in this case. So in general, just to put coins on it, to put numbers to it, um, my weight at the moment is about 15 pounds over where it ought to be, but let's say 213 at the moment, but I will be working during the semester to lose it. So you can watch me over the next uh, 26 lectures and the next 25 lectures and see whether I'm successful or not. Um, eating just got to be real nice during this particular holiday break. It was fascinating. Um, Secondly, I'm about, it's interesting, I was at 1.511 and a half, and I'm now down to about 5'10 and a half, between 5'10 and 5'10 and a half. My son cannot understand, you know, you're not as tall as you used to be. Well, it's happening with age. See, I'm carrying more and more of the carries of the, 
carrying more and more of the carries, cares of the world. And the result is that as you age, you tend to shorten. So you reach your peak physically, I won't necessarily say intellectually, but physically around age 25. And from there on, it is literally downhill uh, in ways that you can't avoid. It's just, it's gonna happen. Um, I'm 68 and growing. Um, Hair, you can make up your own mind about that, but it's roughly medium length. I'm still responding to my mother's uh, dictums of many, many years ago that we, we keep it you know, reasonable. Um, obviously, it's graying. Um, and my race is apparently Caucasian. So, th so the point there essentially is that, that there are a number of different things that are illustrated there that you and I are doing constantly. One is that we are constantly observing behavior, our own behavior to make sure that we're doing what we're supposed to do and not doing what we're not supposed to do, um, and others' behaviors to see whether they are acting out or doing what they're supposed to do. We use small bits of information and often very subtle cues from people as to whether or not uh, it's really gonna be fun and entertaining and interesting and valuable to us to strike up a conversation with somebody or not. Um, and we make inferences about one another based on information as, as, as minimal as I've already given you about me. Many times just in face-to-face -face interaction um, or in, even in walking toward them. You make a decision, you think about it, whether or not you look at somebody in the hallway is based on about a half a second worth of processing. If the two of you are both walking, you know, at three or four miles an hour toward each other, that means you've got a closing rate of six to eight miles an hour. And yet in that length of time, you decide I like that person or I should socially acknowledge them or whatever is involved. But think about all the other things that go into that. These are some of the processes we're gonna be looking at during the course of the semester. But just eye contact, for instance, is, is there's a very strict set of rules, not, not written down, but things that you and I respond to in the simple act of passing two people in the hallway. Think about how, how bizarre it would be if somebody locked eyes with you, you know, 20, 30 feet away. And simply did that as they walked past you, or as you walked past them. That would never happen. I mean, people just don't make eye contact like that. The other thing is exactly when do we break it off and how do we break it off? You know, when people walk past you, they don't tend to go, you know, if, if they look this way at you, that's a kind of an insult, you know, it's kind of like, oh my God, or whatever, we don't do that. We, we either look at them and acknowledge them, hi, how are you, whatever. Um, another comment I can make related to that before going on is, do you ever notice that when you say hello to somebody, they will say hello to you? If you say hi to them, they say hi to you. You say good morning, good morning. Good afternoon, good afternoon. And the only thing where you don't tend to get parroted back is when you ask a question. How are you? Well, the other person doesn't say, how are you? In that case, they will respond. But in general, because the contact, is so, the contact time is so short, we tend to have a series of rituals that are largely automated. And one of the automations that eliminates need to think is simply whatever they say to you, say to them. Unless in the, in the process of starting to say good morning, you realize they've, oh, they've said, how am I? Uh, and then you'll do some extra processing. But, but the timing of the, that passing sequence is so brief that we, we largely automate the actual process that we go through in, the, in, trying, to, uh, in trying to acknowledge each other or fail to, as, as the case may be. Um, and beyond that, then, the, the other point I was going to make is that in, in acknowledging who they are or recognizing who they are, we make other decisions about whether we like them or not. Did we have a date with them last night? Is it an instructor to whom we owe a paper so we need to avoid them or go into a room or something so we don't have to pass them? Uh, and so forth and so on. But there's a lot of processing that goes into that very first uh, contact. And that's but one of many different things that we'll be looking at during the course of the semester is the kind of the social rules that we use in, in interacting with each other. Um, <clears throat> beyond that, um, what I'd like to do is to uh, try and figure out what I had in my notes here, but I think there was another slide that I wanted to look at um, and go through a couple of different things here. And that is basically to look at um, my, um, what I'm going to do basically is, is to study here. Oh, we gave you the answers. I know what I was going to go into, and that is the following. Uh, it ties into what I've already done with you, and that is you've made some decisions about, or we've described the way in which you and I make decisions about each other. Let me pose another situation to you. That somebody actually studied this formally in a rather fascinating study, and it was conducted in a grocery store parking lot. 
What people did, what the, what the investigators here did, was to develop a grocery list, just like what you see on the screen there now, and they handed it to people uh, in the grocery store, into, or in the grocery parking lot, uh, to people who were coming out of the store, so they had obviously just gone through the process of looking at all the information in the, in the store and making decisions. Uh, they'd shopped. Um, and what they said to them was, we're, we're psychologists who are conducting a study of uh, shopping behavior. And I would be interested in having you um, look at this grocery list and make some decisions, try to describe the kind of a person that would have gone into this store with this specific grocery list. And that was the, the presentation that was given to everybody, whether they were in the control or the experimental. This particular group really just stacked one set of responses against another, and you'll see what was, what was found here in a minute. But um, they were simply given a grocery list with the, with the request that they describe. Give a brief description of what you think you know about somebody who would go into the grocery store with this kind of a list. <clears throat> This is one list that was given. There were actually two lists that were used, one for one group, one for the other, but they were given out randomly, one versus the other. This is the item that is key. If you notice this, I'm gonna switch the list now. Just watch what happens to that item. Okay? Instead of being uh, a percolated brand where you have to pour it into the, the, you know, you have to do some work to actually generate the previous kind of coffee uh, with a pot and timing and, and all filtering and all that other stuff. In this case, it's just a matter of get some hot water, pour a cup of, uh, pour a, a teaspoon in and you're off to work or whatever you're, you're planning to do. Well, it turns out that that one difference in item, everything else is the same, and any of them are, are items that we might have very well looked at, or any of us might go into the grocery store for, so it's not a unique identifier at all. But the difference in description that was gotten by these investigators was poles apart, depending on which you had. The original person was described as a thrifty person, um, a careful homemaker, uh, whether it was man or woman, although it was typically described as, as a woman because that for some reason that was just determined to be a woman's list. But either way, um, people who had the previous list with the, with the Maxwell House uh, 16 ounce um, were determined to be careful people who shopped carefully, who cared for their children, uh, who were in love with their family and were typically part of a, a four-person four family, two kids, two parents. Um, and that was generated out of that list. This list, on the other hand, tended to be described, or the, the holders of that were described as philanderers, as, as wasteful, as sloppy shoppers, as last minute shoppers, and so forth and so on. And, and about every positive that was cited about the, the representative of the typical American family carrying the previous Maxwell House list was all solid and good. But the one that had one particular instance of, of exemplar of time saving in it led to a description that was just totally opposite in, in, in the latter case being uh, somebody who didn't plan very well, the house was not as well done, um, well maintained, uh, the marriage was not as happy, they, there was some intimation they might be considering a divorce, uh, and the kids were not as well managed and so forth. All of that was one item difference on an otherwise identical seven item grocery list. And the point is simply to, to demonstrate yet again that you and I, we in general, we humans, make a lot of decisions about people based on remarkably little information, okay? And, and the, I don't think the point can be made any more, any more directly than that. I love that study. It's, it's just it gives you so much to work with based on such a simple design. Would you mind describing this person? That's all they were asked to do. It took about two minutes to collect the data from each person. So basically what I'm going to try and do um, is to develop and refine the manner in which you do both observation and analysis of your own behavior and also others. So during the course of the semester, we'll have a particular perspective here that is problems of, of normal life. Um, but in fact, um, there will be one major difference here in terms of, of what I'm doing um, as I go through this. And I'd like to cut back to the, to the um, screen here for just a minute and show you the following kind of a demonstration. And this is really simply by way of illustrating that what we will try to do is use the television during the course of the semester for the kind of thing that television is particularly good at illustrating, and that is moving uh, demonstrations and, and simply those where a visual image of, of whatever you're working with is, is, um, is important. Do you remember the name of this particular illusion? It's the vertical horizontal illusion. And in fact, in doing that, there are a couple of ways in which we can use television in another way. If we take the vertical component of that particular illustration 
and spread it out. In other words, we're demonstrating essentially that it is a square that that, that vertical component is representing. And if we simply take the other dimension of the illusion and multiply it this way, we can demonstrate again that that is in fact a line drawn from a square. That is the two lines, vertical and horizontal, are exactly the same length. Unfortunately, it translates a little bit poorly here because television is inherently a kind of a three by five or three by four um, image screen size and that tends to slightly bias some of the pictures. So I did the best job I could, but it turns out this looks a little taller than it was intended to. But in fact, the two lines that we gave you were in fact a truly equal vertical and horizontal illusion and it's just the stretch in the television screen that's, that's messed this one up a little bit. So I apologize for that. But in essence, we will be trying to use the television for what the television is particularly good for. And as I look at the, the, um, the, the course that I'll be offering here, um, I've got three kind of primary goals that I have in mind for what I want to accomplish. One of them is to do a series of introductions. I want to introduce you, for instance, to, to what it is that psychology can contribute to your knowledge of the problems that you face in everyday life and the normal human-human interactions that you're going to be faced with. Um, I'm going to be looking at the kinds of behavior that we study under the rubric of, of um, psychology or problems of normal life. Another way you could title this course would be simply to talk about it as psychology of adjustment. It's just got a slightly fancier title, but adjustment is basically what we're talking about here, uh, assuming normality of the people that we're, we're studying. Thirdly, what I'm going to try and do is to, to introduce you to the terminology and the principles um, that psychologists have developed uh, in describing the various phenomena that we're, that we're looking at here. And finally then, I'm going to be looking at the, the various techniques and procedures that we've used in these kind of studies. Uh, so that's, that's the, the general thing that I want to try to introduce you to. Um, secondly, um, I'd like to have you gain an additional appreciation for the lawfulness of, of behavior. I'm going to assume, since you're taking a, a, a junior, senior level psychology course, that you already have appreciated the general lawfulness. And I'm simply going to try to build, supply some more evidence for you that in fact human and animal behavior is predictable. And it's predictable because it's lawful. It follows a sequence of principles that we can in fact isolate and, and study as we wish. So the second thing I'm going to try and do is, is to further document your, your belief, my hope for belief, in the, the lawfulness of, of the behavior that we're looking at. And really, if you think about it as an aside comment here, we wouldn't have a discipline of psychology if, if behavior itself, which is our subject matter, weren't ultimately lawful. It would be otherwise a simple series of random events. There'd be no way to study what is purely random. So the lawfulness really is, is dependent on, or the, the discipline of psychology is dependent on the lawfulness of, of the phenomena that we study. And then finally, what I'm going to try and do is to demonstrate and relay to you some of the practical applications or skills that may be helpful in day-to-day in -day living for you in, in the years that you yet face. Um, and so those, those will be the three kind of primary things I want to do. General introductions, additional evidence of lawfulness, and, and the, the emphasis on some degree of practical applications, what to do in various kinds of, of situations. So in short, essentially, this is a, a course on, on the problems of normal life with one significant wrinkle for all of us, and that is that it's going to be offered by television. Um, it'll be on the internet, but it is ultimately taped as a, as a uh, television course and then, and then converted to internet format. Um, and that format, the TV uh, viewing system, offers uh, some problems, some, um, some um, mixed blessings and some sheer delight. So let me just review those with you uh, for a few minutes here. And that is to, to look at the, the impact that television can have on, on what we're trying to do. If we look at the problems, one of the major difficulties that you as, as, a, as a viewer sometime in the, in the distance and potentially distant future, um, one of the most obvious problems is that direct contact may seem to be lost between you and me, between thee and me. I want to suggest that the occurrence of that seems to be annoyed by the fact that, gosh, there must be thousands of people viewing these tapes. And it would be such an interruption if I were to, to, uh, to contact these people. Well, quite the contrary. Um, even in the large lectures that I teach, it also seems when you're sitting with 200 people or 500 or whatever, that direct contact is lost. It really isn't. Um, we faculty offer office hours. Um, and in fact, I will have office hours. Traditionally, it's either 11 to 1 or 12 to 2 um, any semester that I'm teaching. So you can figure that if you get to the campus 
um, I will be in my office between those hours and quite willing to talk to people, indeed eager to do so, because my ultimate goal here is, uh, people don't tend to t like to talk about that a lot, but the contract that the state offers, we are hired ultimately as instructors to teach, not to do research. The research is a bonus, it's, it's a benefit that, that we get to, that we give to the university and the university gives to us by way of support for research activities and so forth. But ultimately our salaries are driven by, by, um, by teaching. Uh, you can do bad research and you just don't get published, but if you do bad teaching, you're ultimately fired. And so what I'm, what I'm really arguing is that ultimately the faculty are here to teach. Now I give you that by way of sideline advice to justify the mainline piece of advice that I'll give you, and that is don't let us get away with not e educating you. That is, we are obligated to, and most of us do willingly serve office hours, use them. That's the most widely squandered resource in, in higher education, as I see it, based on the number of people who don't come talk to me. Uh, I, I used to hold up, uh, ask a question at the end of a semester, how many of you have been around to see me sometime during the semester? 15% of the hands will go up. So 85%, I've always taken a lot of pride out of that, figuring I must be an incredibly good educator to be able to respond to 85% of all, the, or I should say all of the needs of 85% of the people. Um, but that's a little bit self-serving, I would acknowledge that. Let me just suggest that if you have a trouble at any particular time, email one of the, the uh, teaching assistants who will be announced in the course by way of uh, email during the first week of the uh, semester uh, with contact information and so forth, or come in and see me, email me. In fact, uh, I'd rather actually prefer emails to telephone calls only because if I don't get, if I'm not there to answer it, that then obligates me to call you. And when I call people typically, they're not home. So then we get into telephone tag, and that's a waste of everybody's time. So I think it's easier to email. I've got a record of what you asked. I've got a record of when I answered and so forth. So just email, but you're welcome to do that at any time. And a little bit later in the sem uh, semester, I started to say in the lecture, uh, I'll give you the, the email address here, either today or tomorrow. I'm gonna be doing mostly details today and tomorrow, including the discipline that we're gonna be talking about. So um, most of what I cover is in the assigned text. So if there is a problem with not understanding uh, you might want to contact a fellow student, uh, contact the course TA, or then in fact uh, read the text. I know that's radical, but, but most cases what I'm talking about is covered in one way or another in the text, so you can find it there. Um, or come see us. I mean, by all means, come ask us if, if there's a problem at any point with understanding something. The second thing with television is that it's fleeting. It's here one minute and, and gone the next. Um, and I'll give you an example of what that's going to require of you, and that is that you're going to have to watch the tapes to get the knowledge. Um, I will ask you, I've been waving my hands around in front of you now for about 15 minutes, um, and the question I would ask you is, am I or am I not wearing a ring? Okay, so you guys uh, can come back to me for a minute on the picture and let's do a vote. How many of you would think, if we, if we can go to the wide shot of showing who's here, how many of you by show of hands think that I am wearing a ring? One or more rings, including the one through my nose, of course. Um, okay, if you're that sharp, now you're probably just thinking at the moment, well, he looks marriageable, so he's got to have at least one, um, and so forth. And now let's check that. How many of you think I'm wearing one ring and one ring only? Okay. How many would go with two rings? How many would go with three rings or more? Okay, well, that's pretty pronounced, and in fact, you're correct. Uh, there is one ring on there. Um, but that's the kind of thing that in some cases you'll be asked very subtle things about what we've been talking about. But in fact, I will assure you that when I give you an exam, I can go back to a TV tape and show you where the material was discussed. So if we talk about it in class, uh, well, I'll put it the other way around. If it's on the exam, you can figure that it was in the book or it was in the lecture itself. That is, I won't test you on what I haven't talked about, but I will test you on what I have talked about, just to give some idea of, of how well you've mastered it. Okay, so it's fleeting, but the, the, um, the, the key there is to pay attention and view the tapes. Related to that, I, the syllabus that you will have um, in the books that I'm going to be talking about here in a few minutes um, does have a recommended viewing time and that starts almost immediately. So you're probably right now slightly behind. Don't worry about it. But what I would try to do is to get caught up so that you've actually viewed the tape, uh, sorry, you've done the reading, the assigned reading before viewing the tape and then view the tape as soon after that as you can. In other words, try to do both of them close together because they reinforce each other and it'll make it easier for you to master the material that we're gonna be talking about during the course of the um, semester. Um, 
So in fact, it is important to pay attention. Give you an example of how you really do need to pay attention. I had a guest a visitor talking to my introductory class last spring, uh, and he brought with him one of the most stunning pieces of television that I have ever seen. What he did was to take a classroom that was, oh, I don't know, maybe it was a typical kind of 30-person classroom. It had about 30 seats in it and, and uh, was just comfortably bigger with aisles front and back. So it, it was, uh, let's say, maybe 30 by 30 total size. And he simply put a camera over in the corner up at the top, looking down to where he could see essentially the whole classroom. And what he had done was to get six people uh, of roughly the same height, six of whom were dressed in solid black, black shirt, black pants, and so forth. The other six, equal mix of, of males, females, um, were dressed in black pants, everything else black, but the shirt was white. Okay, and as the film started, what he had done was to set up the demo by saying, as you watch this group, they are going to be passing a white volleyball around the room. They're going to be passing a ball back and forth from people to people. I want you to tell me the number of times the ball is tossed. Okay, and so it didn't matter whether it was black shirts or white shirts, but he did make a reference to um, the movement of the relative, uh, that is the, the way he structured the instructions, they were, the key feature was count the number of times the balls change hands, the ball changes hands, and keep track of whether it's a black or a white player, black shirted or white shirted player who catches the ball. And so you had to keep track of two things, when the ball changed hands and then tally again, okay, black shirt, white shirt, and it, and it wasn't that hard. I mean, it was like three uh, of the white shirts and four of the black shirts actually held the ball uh, when, it, when, it, when they received it. But you watch the students and they were like this, right in the middle of that tape, and I watched it the first time under the instructions I've just given you and I missed it entirely. What happened was that, that um, a, a person draped in an, ape, in an ape suit walked right through the middle of the image. He started over on one side out of the, the uh, out of, in the back corner. Uh, he entered through a door that was already open as the, as the ball was being tossed back and forth. He walked right up into the middle of the camera, so it was analogous to standing right halfway between me and the television camera. He looked around, and then he continued. Slow pace, I mean, he was moving not any faster than any of the people were. He was on screen for a total of seven seconds. Walked in, looked around both ways, and then walked out. When the speaker, guest speaker, gave that demonstration to the lecture, the, the lecture hall was, it was uh, Agnes Arnold number one, if you're familiar with it here on campus, but it seats about almost 500 people, and it was full uh, because it was a guest speaker. The vote on whether anything unusual other than the ball passing back and forth, 500 people voting, about 15% of the people actually detected that that ape had walked through there, that ape had gone through. They were so concentrated on how many times the ball changed hands and whether it was a black shirt or a white shirted person who'd caught it, that they just totally missed something that was irrelevant. If the ape didn't catch the ball, the ape wasn't fa factored in. He just, wasn't, he just wasn't there. If the ape caught the ball and then fired it on, the people that detected it jumped to about 95, 98%. Some few were still so concentrated on, okay, black top, <laughs> that that's all they tallied, not that it was a hairy gorilla that actually caught it. But that's an example of, of the value of attention, basically. When you're in that kind of simple situation, when you're focused on uh, a particular feature, you can look at that to the oblivion of everything else. Uh, that's very concentrated attention, but that can be very helpful when you're watching a, a, um, a, a lecture. Uh, if you've got that ability to zone in and really attend to what we're looking at. And, and the, 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 the pertinence of, of this to fleetingness is that that's one of the values of paying attention, because even things that happen briefly like that, you can catch if you're concentrating in, in the right way. So then let's go back to the list, and, and let me also show you um, some examples of, of the um, mixed blessings that, that uh, I think we've got here. Uh, one of the difficulties is that per unit of time, you're going to get more information here than probably in any other setting. And I don't mean uniquely this lecture, but I mean college lectures generally. That is some of the most concentrated relaying of information that you'll ever be exposed to during your life. 
and it comes about, it's, it's a situation that may or may not work effectively. You take people who know a lot about a particular area and then turn them loose to talk in a given area and they start talking about what they know and like. And the problem may be that they will not give it um, the explanation that they really should have. So they tend to talk too fast relative to the people who are being instructed, uh, number one. Number two, you're in a class to learn. Uh, and so you kind of implicitly by being here, you're acknowledging this is an area I don't know as much about as I'd like to. Uh, so you've got this person who thinks they know everything about it and the person who doesn't know as much as they'd like to about it. And sometimes they're like ships passing in the night. Uh, there's just too much given in a given situation to, tr to try and profit from it. I'll be talking about a course outline here in a couple of minutes, which has been designed specifically to help you take course notes and also to give you a record of what I'm actually talking about. Uh, so if you see a picture, a, a, a graph on the screen at any time during the semester, do not worry about copying it down. I can remember going into chemistry classes when I was an undergraduate and I almost got finger cramps trying to copy down all the diagrams in organic chemistry and so forth. That was not a favored uh, intellectual experience on my part and I am trying to avoid putting you into the situation where you get that same kind of experience. So if it's an image that I talk about or a graph that's important, it'll be in the book that we'll be asking you to get. So. So I will keep you in mind in that respect. But per unit of time in a college lecture, you do need to pre be prepared for the fact that you're going to see a lot of information before we get done. Secondly, psychology has a reputation for being a, uh, an entertaining, attention-getting blow-off course. I would strongly urge you not to assume that perspective in any psychology course. And uh, if you don't believe me, you're welcome to go over to the bulletin board across from my office in uh, Heine Hall here at the University of Houston and check the number of F's. Not that I give that many F's, but it was just people that, for instance, got into a course and then forgot to drop. Uh, that's a no-no in college. If you decide you're not going to go to a course, a class, my syllabus will include in it notations during the semester. There's a point early in the semester, uh, about five, a, a week in, when you can drop the course and there's no record at all anytime you're engaged, in, and this is true of any course. There's another time about probably 60% of the way, even 70% of the way through the semester, where if you don't drop by that date, you can no longer get a W. So the W grade is only available from when you enroll in a course until the, the between the first deadline, which is you get out of it and there's no record kept at all, or the second date when you decide for whatever reason. By then you will have had two of the four tests in this class, so you'll have as much information as I can give you at that point. But if you don't drop by that second one or that date on the syllabus, you then will have a grade. That is, I have no way to give you uh, a withdrawal at that point. That's a university rule that, that we're just stuck with, so I'm just kind of forewarning you to it. And the deadline for that will also be included on the syllabus. Um, but it, it is a course that, that will be taught as a, what it is, which is a social keyword science course. So I will be funding, basing this on the founding this on, on um, the, the uh, principles that the discipline itself is based on. It is a science, we'll be teaching it that way. And finally then, we've also got a series of, of uh, oh, I've talked about expectations, let me get on to delights. And that is um, closeness is one of the things that we will be able to achieve here in, in ways that, um, that you can't normally do with television. So in some cases you may see just a picture of my mouth if for some reason we need to talk about that. You'll be a lot closer to me than you've been to most instructors you've ever been instructed with, uh, at least as far as I know and care to know. Um, but in fact, television does allow us to get up close and personal with, with the various kind of things that we, that we, can, um, we can talk about. Um, another thing that will be, that will be um, very good here are the visual aids. Uh, that is, I've, I've spent a long time teaching and pulling together material with which to teach this course. So I think we'll have an interesting array of illustrations of the concepts we're talking about and photos of, of what we're talking about. Um, and and um, the aids should be good. Since I have a lousy handwriting, I have an intention tremor that's always there. Uh, my father spent a lot of money trying to decide whether it was an abnormality. It wasn't. I just have a, there is a, in the nervous system, the, most of you are blessed with a final smoothing function. Because if you think about it, it's an interesting intellectual problem, but if you think about it, if you decide to reach, you know, you're just sitting there with your hands folded in front of you and you decide to reach for a glass of water, that decision is digital. You do reach, you don't reach. So the initial start of the action, which itself is continuous, is actually an on-off, a yes-no digital decision. 
and in my system, you know, in yours and mine, there's a large sequence of, of learning, you know, when we're five years old, we're not so skilled at picking up a glass, but the initial decision to do so then, then generates some kind of very shaky kind of getting the thing to your, to your mouth. But in my case, the very last function, uh, that, that smoothing function, that integration of the last series of digital signals prior to moving a, a given muscle, misfires occasionally. And the result is there's a very slight tremor in my hand. You'll hear it in my voice very occasionally if I get excited about something and my voice will tremor slightly. But don't worry about it. I'm not about to have a heart attack. I've survived with it for <clears throat> years. Um, and so it isn't a problem. So just don't be nervous for me because I'm not nervous about what I'm doing. So just relax and enjoy the ride. Um, another thing that will, will be helpful is the, um, the um, notes that I'm going to be talking about. And um, if I can uh, get the samples of the two books, um, I can just show you what we're going to be, um, be talking about here. Um, one is the, um, is the text. And if we can cut back to me for a minute, I'll show you what the, the book will always look like with one exception. And that is, this is what the front of the book will look like. And it's called, essentially, Problems of Normal Life. Uh, and in this instance, it's the third edition. We will likely have moved past this in, in subsequent editions of the course prior to uh, a retaping. So the, the, the format of the page will always be the same. It happens that this semester's color is, I am told, orchid. Uh, so I apologize for that. But orchid is the color that we've got this semester. Next semester, I'll try to make it cherry red or something significantly more related to the U of H. But this is a topical outline of everything that I'll be talking about during the course of the semester. And for instance, if there's a graph in there that I need to, or that, that I need to talk about, you will find that there's an image of it there um, reproduced. So that'll be on the screen when I'm talking about it. You don't need to worry about copying it down. It'll simply be there, and you can take as many notes on it as you want. The, uh, the book, in general, is set up so that, um, and as soon as I look for an example of what I'm about to say, uh, a bad one pops up. Normally, the outline of the course will be down the left side of the page, uh, and there'll be plenty of room on the right for you to add any particular comments that you want to. So this is the sequence in which I'll be going through the topics. Um, but there'll be room, plenty of room for you to write down anything additional that you want to think of. You can edit, you know, put in things like dumb example, whatever. Uh, I'll never see it, but this is for you uh, to increase your uh, mastery of the, uh, of the course material itself. And um, the other thing that we will also be looking at is the, is the course text itself, um, which is Psychology Applied to Modern Life. This is the ninth edition of the, of the text that I'm holding here at the moment. Um, the form of it may change. The title is very unlikely to, uh, because we've just entered the, it was interesting, the previous title of it was Psychology in the 20th Century. And of course, here a decade or so ago, that changed. So they suddenly had to come up with a new title for the book. And it is now called simply Psychology Applied to Modern Life, which is what we're going to be doing, um, adjustment in the 21st century. You could pretty much count on that being the title for your whole life without any particular problem. The one thing that will change is this is the ninth edition. And to the extent possible, the lectures are made general enough so that they will apply to any text. So when the 10th edition comes out, uh, and this one came out just as the lecture was being taped initially, so the correlation will be pretty good. But I will theoretically try to keep the lectures consistent with the book. So I will update the edition to the 10th when it comes out, the 11th, and so forth, uh, as that becomes necessary. Uh, so although the book may not look exactly like this, the title will be the same. And in this instance, they have just added uh, some new authors um, that uh, have not previously been there. Um, the book was initially authored by White and, and Lloyd, Wayne White and, and Margaret Lloyd. Um, they have now added um, Dana Dunn and Elizabeth Yost Hammer, uh, who's over in uh, LSUNO, I think is where she is. She's over in New Orleans. But in any case, they now have four authors rather than two. So I can't speak to who the authors may be, but I know the title will be the same. So these will be the two course texts that are required for you to be in the course. And some of the papers you'll need to hand in are actually in the, the notes uh, book that I recommended for you. But those are the two major things that we'll be using during the course of the um, semester. Um, and so um, I would strongly urge that you get them, because they'll be extraordinarily helpful in getting you through the, um, getting you through the course um, effectively. And then finally, I don't know whether I've got another uh, note to talk about here uh, or not. And that is, oh yes, I do, um, a project. I'm going to, um, what I'm going to ask you to do 
is, and I'll, I'll give you a lead in right now, we're going to talk about it in more detail uh, in the next lecture, but uh, what I'm going to be asking you to do during the semester is to take a habit of yours that you don't like, something that you do that you really wish you didn't, okay, and change it. What I want you to do is not just sit down and decide, okay, I'm going to change this. I want you to develop a plan which you're ultimately going to submit to me about how you're going to change it. That is, we're going to ask you to use the principles of psychology in some way as, as we're talking about them this semester to pick whatever piece of your own behavior you don't particularly like and alter it. Make it more comfortable for you so that you react the way you wish you would in every situation. Now, if you're perfect, I'm willing to take an essay on your perfection and I will grade it. And if you don't get a good grade, you'll be figured not to have done the assignment, but uh, that shouldn't be a problem. I don't know anybody that doesn't have a habit they couldn't change. And if you have trouble lining it up, um, come see me and I can suggest one to you. Make sure you press the button on the speaker when you, when you talk, but you're welcome to jump in with a question. Well, when she figures out, we'll acknowledge her and, and uh, come in with a, um, a question. There is a system by which you have to uh, um, jump in to, to answer a question. Are you ready to go now? Okay. Um, is the project just an essay? Good question. And I'm going to leave that up to you. Uh, in fact, I do not want an essay. Okay? Uh, part of what you do may come in as an essay. But let me wait till I talk about it next lecture to give you the more details on it. But what I'm really after is, uh, for me, and hopefully for you, the bulk of the project is what you do, not what you give to me. Okay? So the, the intent there is really to get you in. What I'm trying to do is, is to get you away from the traditional do a term paper on X, Y, or Z, a topic that I've selected and you've got to do 71 words and it's got to be one inch margins. You know, I don't want that. What I want is, is whatever will best report what you did. Um, but I would presume that if you're doing some kind of a systematic behavioral change, and I'll recommend some books to you on, on how to do that, um, that you will, you will, um, um, you will, provide the kind of data that they give you examples of uh, in, in doing that. But let me know, I'm getting ahead of myself here and I'm kind of giving partial information and I, my intent is not really to do so. So we will, um, we will base the, the course uh, itself on the, the um, text by, by White and et al. and the Problems of Normal Life text uh, outline, both of which are available in the, um, I probably shouldn't say this on, on UH television, but they're at the college bookstore over at the corner of Scott and Elgin. But if you tell anybody, I will deny having said it. So, so but that's, that's the best place to go get it. And I know if some of you are, are viewing it in, um, in Never Never Land somewhere else, you know, and maybe even as far out as Katie, um, you can actually call the bookstore and they have a fee. I don't know what it is, so I'm not trying to represent market it or anything like that, but they will send it to you to save you having to drive in. Uh, if you don't otherwise come to campus anyway, but that's that's the place where the course materials are are available. Um, there are a variety of other books like the White and Lloyd um, et al. book, and uh, if you feel more comfortable reading those, I have no problem if you want to do that. There are various other psychoadjustment books. The kind of book that I'll be recommending that you do the project with is Watson and Thorpe. It's it's the seventh edition of it. Um, I would not recommend that you do that kind of a book because that was very specifically written to take people or, or give people help who've got a habit they want to alter. And there are a series of strategies that are recommended in there, which we'll be talking about in, in, the, in the next lecture. Uh, so I wouldn't use that as, as a, a general indicator. But there, traditionally, there have been books like, for instance, Ronald Cohen had a book called Psychology and Adjustment, Values, Culture, and Change. That's essentially what we're talking about and under a slightly different label. So if you've, if you've got an author that you prefer, I have no problem if you want to do the reading in, in that way. Uh, because the content of almost all the books is the same. What I would also recommend you do, uh, it's not required and I won't be grading it, but you may find it very helpful if you will look up the, the what's normally called a student study guide or a student manual to accompany any book that you're, a book that you're using. Um, and if, you, if you're using the White and Lloyd, Dunn and, and um, uh, Hammer text, there is a student study guide developed to accompany it. You may find that very important uh, to, uh, very important aid to your studying. 
and so I would encourage you to get it, but I will not be grading it. There won't be any required assignments in that kind of a thing. Um, but it can be a very helpful way because it's written with the, I mean, the author has supervised the development of that study guide, so they've written something that will help you master what the author is trying to convey. So that's probably a worthwhile investment if you need additional channels of, of uh, input in, in that situation. Um, so don't be afraid to go get the uh, study guide if, if you need to do so. They will include general notes accompanying the text, sometimes amplifying statements on whatever's been in the book. They will typically include review questions um, and, in fact, sometimes demonstrations and or experiments that you can do. I'm kind of talking to the church choir here about uh, choir matters, so you're already familiar with that if you ever looked at a study guide. But I would recommend in this case this course, that, that book would, is, does have a good, our book does have a good, uh, good study guide attached to it. The Whiten book has a very good study guide. So uh, as we look at, at the um, series of events that I want to go through here today, why don't we jump back to the um, letters so that I can talk about um, what's basically involved. And so far we've looked at, at two matters, problems that we're going to face and how we're going to deal with them. We've looked at mixed blessing delights and so forth. And now what I'm going to do is jump over to a variety of hints about how to survive and thrive. Um, and that includes the information that I've just given you about the various texts, the two texts that we will be using. Secondly, what I would recommend and spend some time developing with you here is that you develop a good set of notes. Um, my lesson in this was, was rather interesting, and that is that um, when I went into uh, graduate school at the University of Iowa for my master's degree, uh, I was put right into an exquisitely good statistics course um, at, at a graduate level. Um, now, I'm, I like statistics, and, I, and I'm comfortable with it, and so forth. Um, the instructor was amazing. It, it was, he was the, the senior author of, of a, a classic book on, on uh, uh, analysis of variance, which is one of the, the standard statistical analytic techniques for more complex multi-group uh, studies. And when this man came in, it was interesting. The, the room seated, it was, it was a typical college classroom. It was about five seats wide and 40 seats deep. Uh, so they could, well, it wasn't quite that many, 20 seats deep. But you could seat about 80 people in a room that only had room for about five chairs across. And the problem was that this instructor put everything on the blackboard. Uh, and he actually wrote out his lecture notes. So as he was describing statistics, he was giving you an absolutely elegant set of notes. And so he started out, first day, Roman numeral one, I'll never forget it, and it had to do with uh, uh, descriptive statistics, and about a third of the course was filling in Roman numeral one, so the next day it was 1A and then 1A1 and so forth, and I had a perfect set of notes out of that. The problem is that he wrote very fast, and I'm a lousy handwriter. That's one reason I'm going to be using so much PowerPoint, because if I wrote it by hand here on the desk, you wouldn't be able to read it, I can guarantee that. So I would take these frantic notes. And then what I had to do immediately after class was go back to my office and write out the notes. I had to take the notes that I'd taken in class as fast as I could over his hurried handwriting and translate them back into neatly printed notes. And it was so helpful because what, what I did then was to immediately review what the instructor had been talking about. And in some cases, it was very complex analytic analysis of variance techniques. I had, I got, that was the first A I got in graduate school was taken out of that course and, and because, and I'm absolutely positive, it was not because I was brilliant in statistics, but because I took the time in a complex class to sit down and review the notes immediately afterwards. I mean, I walked down the hallway into my office and wrote. Um, and the net result was I had a set of notes that I, uh, many friends kept coming in to borrow. After I got an A on the first test, all of a sudden everybody stopped by to borrow my notes immediately afterwards. So there is a helpful hint in, in developing of notes. And what I want to do is share with you a couple of them. One of which is what's called the, the um, Cornell plan. And it, it starts with a very basic series of, of recommendations. And that is how do you organize the paper on which you're taking notes? And you'll see that the simple psych book is basically lined up in this way. Um, and that is, what you do in order to, to set notes up if you're going to be doing a fresh set of notes, and this is true of any course, not just this one, but you take the note paper that you're going to be using and you basically, why is it doing this? It's backing up instead of going forward. I don't quite under, there we go. Now it's doing what I told it to do. First thing you do is draw a line top to bottom about two inches in from the left side on the page. On every page you're going to take notes on. It may be easier to take one sheet and Xerox it repeatedly because I'm going to make a couple of suggestions. Um, and then across the bottom, about an inch up, you do a second line. And that'll be maybe an inch or an inch and a half up. 
And then what we're going to do with this paper is use it in the following way. And that is, what you're going to do is put the notes in the biggest portion of the page. So you'll get maybe 250 words in that section. That's in whatever the instructor is saying that you find to be of value. If it's not going into a book like Problems of Normal Life, you would put it in the notes section. Then, after class, what you do is to go through those notes and abstract them. What you're going to do is essentially what is called psychologically recode them. What you're going to do is put them in your own words. So where you may have 250 hurriedly scribbled words on the right side, I want you to end up on the, your goal should be on the left side to have five at the max ten words. Okay? And so what you're basically doing is recoding what, what, you, what the instructor has been talking about, whatever you've been studying in class. And so the, the left side of the page becomes your reworking. That has two advantages directly uh, speaking as an educator. The first is that you're doing it in your words, not the instructor's ultimately. Now you may decide to use his or her words because you know, that's, that's the topic that you're actually talking about, but it's just as easy to capture the spirit of it in your words. But what you're trying to do there is to re-outline the lecture notes that you've been given or have taken uh, in a way that is more efficient. So what you do is collapse from 250 words to five or 10. Let's even take 10. That's still a 25 to 1 reduction. Think of the increase ease of memory. If instead of having to memorize 250 words, you've got five to remember. That's a lot easier to handle. And it makes studying a lot easier, too, because then if, once you get your system functioning and it's working effectively, if you need to study the material because you know, it's fresh enough that you just don't understand it, then you can look at the big side, the notes side, and tie it into the coded words. That is, you can make a specific series of relations in your own head between that word, the code word you've developed, and what it is trying to cue you to recall. And then ultimately, when you study, uh, all you have to do is take that page that you've developed and fold it along the line on the left side. So then all you've got is the code words left. And as long as you can go down through the code words that you've got and recall what's over on this note side, think of how much easier it is to study because all you have to do is review these notes, and if, if, if your notes, your coding, actually captures the essence of whatever material you're trying to remember, a lot easier to remember five words than 250. And so it, it becomes a very effective study technique with the advantage that if you can't remember, the answer is right there. But what you're trying to do is force yourself to, to get to the point where you master the code words more so than the, the uh, notes. Um, the bottom part has a, a slightly different use for it, and that is, Questions and comments. You may find when you're going through your history notes that the instructor you distinctly remember has, has, has stated there were three primary economic factors contributing to the Civil War, United States of America, 1860 to 1865. And as you're going through your notes, reviewing what you wrote down about the uh, Confederate War, um, you realize, my goodness, I've only got two causes here. That's a place where you put something on the bottom of the sheet. So when you're reviewing your notes, if you don't remember something, write it down there. If there's a question you need to get answered or a piece of information you need to get to, go to a fellow student. Go to the graduate student in the class or, as a last resort, ask at the next class. What's implicit in that is another piece of advice that I'll give you, which is off the record, and that is that if you have a problem in any class at any time, do not let it fester. If you have a problem with this first lecture, talk to somebody related to the course before the second one and get the problem fixed. Because this class, unlike uh, introductory psych, for instance, is cumulative. What we talk about in, in the first semester, first part of the semester, is going to be important to understanding what we talk about in the middle of the semester. And what we talk about at the beginning and the middle is going to be important to studying, understanding what's at the end. In other words, the course is cumulative, ultimately. Well, I guess I should say it this way, it's cumulative. Uh, and therefore, if you don't understand something in the first two weeks of, of a course, you're going to have trouble understanding something two weeks from the end of the course. And that can be altered by simply getting any misinformation or lack of understanding corrected as early as possible. And that's true in any course. It's, it's free advice. You can apply it anywhere you need to. But in general, it will help, particularly in cumulative courses. If you understand what's at the beginning, uh, it makes it easier to, to understand what's at the end. Now. Um, what I'm also going to go into then is a, is a study plan, which is actually developed uh, in a book that's, uh, let's see, it's now, the copyright is over a half century old. 
The book was so good when it was written, I'm not even sure a second edition ever came out. But it's, I'll, give you, I'll have to give it to you by, um, by um, word of mouth because I, don't, I, I forgot to do a slide with the, the image for you. But the authors are Morgan and Deese. It's uh, C.T., Clifford T. Morgan, um, spelled Morgan, and Deese, which is D-E-E-S-E, -E -E, James Deese. The uh, copyright is 1957, and it's called, very complex title, How to Study. That's it. It's published by, um, in New York by McGraw-Hill, so it's a McGraw-Hill text. When it was published, it's a paperback that's about three-eighths of an inch thick. And I say when it was studied because it's still in print. It is still available. And if the bookstore doesn't have it now, I'm sure you can order it through them. It's well worth it. It's, it's only about a 3 8 inch, maybe a half inch, 5-8 uh, kind of text. But it's just jam-packed with information about how to study, covering all different kinds of material and how to do it. And it's, it's well, it's, its longevity has documented its usefulness. It's an extraordinarily useful text. Um, I'm going to, with credit, actually steal two things from there and talk about it a little bit to, so I can give you the guts of, of what the whole, no, I would go get the book anyway, but there are a couple of things that they make as recommendations that I think are, are really particularly good recommendations. One of these is to develop for yourself a schedule. So let's go back to the um, image recorder here and suggest that what I want you to do, <coughs> excuse me, is to set up a, a daily schedule for your, not a daily schedule, I want you to set up a schedule for yourself. I want you to develop a blank schedule. There is one of these in the Problems of Normal Life book, if you want to get it, the first page of the appendix uh, is set up this way, as I'm going to describe here. But you can do it yourself, either way, because this is ultimately for your benefit, not for, for planning, not for handing in uh, specifically uh, a particular format. I will be collecting it, but the format is, uh, the, you'll see the benefit. This is being done for you, is what I'm trying to say. Uh, so what you want to do is put the days of the week across the top. You can start anywhere on this schedule. Traditionally, society starts with a Sunday on the left side. You can do it with Tuesday if you want. Be creative. And down the side, you won't be able to see them because the letters are too small, but it's the time of the day. It starts at 6 a.m. and you have 30-minute increments. Each line is 30 minutes of, of uh, space. Um, unless you worry about whether we've got it, the, um, the rest of the um, page the rest of the time is on the back. So on the front of the page, it goes from 6 a.m. to about 11, I think. And from 11 to, to, to uh, 6 a.m. is on the back side. So if you have a really active nightlife, you can still keep a record of it. That isn't a particular problem. Um, but the idea is that you've got a, a quarter inch high by inch and a quarter wide space to write me an essay, OK? So if you happen to go shopping at some particular time, I do not want you to write a 30-word essay. I mean, I've deliberately given you an inch and a half or an inch and a quarter by half, a quarter inch high because that's all the data I want you to record. This is for you more than me. But don't write an essay about, I went to the grocery store or I went to Community Market 3. Uh, it was crowded. And so I, I don't care. I want you to do a, a, try to do something simple like, like shop, okay? That would capture the spirit of what you were doing and you'll be able to remember it later. So in the morning hours, if the first thing you do when you get up is, um, um, oh, I had some glamorous representation of the fact that I don't want an essay there. There's not room for it, and I don't want you to do it that way. Instead, if the first thing you do when you get up is have a meal, I want you to use a very descriptive word like eat, and that's what you should put there, okay? And that's all you need. Most people can remember the following Tuesday that at 6 a.m., if the first thing they do is have breakfast, then eat means, okay, I had breakfast that day. So don't, don't make it more glamorous than it needs to be. So try and keep it simple. Eat, sleep, and sex. And if anything else interesting happens, I'm sure you'll figure a way to, to represent what was going on. But the, the point is, is not so much the particular words as the activities. And if you think about a typical undergraduate career, there's a limited number of things you and I in academia are doing. We eat, we sleep, we go to school, that is we have classroom activity, we've got homework we have to do, you may have a job, you may be involved in a sports team, but certainly some kind of athletics are going on. Commuting, if you come late, parking also becomes an issue. That could be an hour right there. Um, but there are probably 10 or less words that'll capture what you need. And what I would ask you to do when you finish that sheet for a week, and you can start it anywhere. I was teasing earlier about starting the calendar, but do the whole calendar and then start on Thursday. Don't, Because remember, 
Sunday is going to come around again. So if you start on Thursday, get started now and start wherever you are and then just go to the end, go back to the beginning and fill in the rest because uh, ultimately what I'm after is a general calendar than a specific one. Um, and what I would ask you to do when you're finished with all that is, is to summarize the data. Uh, and you'll find that there are um, a couple of rather interesting things. If we can go back to the um, slide image here. Um, if you look at the, well, in fact, I'm not going to give you that yet. Let me, let me just, I'll give you some information about what I'm, what I'm expecting you'll find. And that is that when you actually summarize what you do for an entire week, one of the things I will expect being a student that you'll be interested in tallying is the number of hours you spend studying, okay? Now, you may have already set out, this being the beginning of the semester, that you're all full of piss and vinegar and you're going to do good stuff and study 25 hours a week and, and really just knock the top off everything. Well, we all do that. Um, but you may find, when you actually track what you do during this next week, that you studied, you intended 20, you studied six. But you've got six solid hours. There were, there were two hours on... Uh, Tuesday and Thursday from 2 to 4 in the afternoon, you manage to sit down with the books and actually interact with what you were attending to. And then you squeeze in another 2 on Sunday afternoon between 1 and 3. But when you're all done at the end of the week, oops, you've only done 6 hours when you meant to do 20. Um, and so you're concerned with the idea that what I'm actually leading you into is, is probably what I would argue is the single most valuable skill that you're going to master in college, and that is time management. You have to be able to control what you do and when you do it. Okay, there's no substitute for success in college other than going to class, but I'll come back and talk about that later. So you tally it, you've got six hours. Do not plan to go from this week six hours to next week 20 hours. Okay, it won't work. It's too big a change in the routine that you're engaged in, and we all have routines that we go through. There's a reason why you ended up with six hours of study time. So if you do want to build it up, you want to increase it, then what I would do is to alter Pick a rate like maybe an hour or two hours a week, alter that much activity, and build up to the schedule you ultimately want. So if it turns out that you do have two hours Tuesday and Thursday between two and four, add a half hour at the front end and the back end on each day. If you start at 1.30 instead of two and go through to 4.30 instead of four, you've just added an hour on Tuesday, another hour on Thursday, that's a two hour change. And it may take a couple of weeks to adjust to it, but you can manipulate most everything except class times, which are kind of rigid and get it to where, okay, now you're doing six just in that four hour time block and you've still got the two on Sunday, so you're up to eight. So you've moved two hours. If that first week goes well, move another two the next week. Maybe add two hours to Sunday, front and back. So now you're studying from one to five and so forth. So basically, don't try to do the whole thing on a given week. And what I'm suggesting is that you may not want to go so far as to, do, to write out a second schedule, but if you do it again, what I would do is take the, the study hours that you did in the hours that were comfortable for you, put them in ink the next time, uh, and just plan your life around, okay, I'm going to study from 1 to 3 on, Tuesday, uh, on uh, Sunday and 2 to 4 on, on Tuesday and Thursday. Um, and then add the hours to that. And if it works, then put those in in ink. Put the, the six hours in in ink, uh, sorry, the eight hours in in ink the second week. And then start adding to that. And, and that's, with that strategy, you can ultimately regain control of your life and really spend time the way you mean to do it. Because ultimately, time is going to be spent whether you focus on it or not. And I'm just suggesting you focus on it. Make an issue of what you specifically want to do. Uh, and then live your life accordingly. Now, this shows a rather interesting survey that was done at the University of New Mexico many years ago. Um, not that many years ago, but I've, I've replicated it a couple of times, and it's very typical of what happens nowadays. And that is if you ask people, only those students who have a full 15 or 16 hour load, that is a traditional full load in, in college, how much time do you spend studying? You get the following kind of data. 36% study in that range I was talking about, something around six hours, so zero to nine hours. That includes the bright people. I had colleagues in my class, I'm sure you've got them in yours, never crack a book, always get an A. You're going to have to deal with that the rest of your life. It's not cheating, it's not unfair, it is simply the distribution of the brain cells that the world has to offer, okay? You get a certain portion, everybody else gets a certain portion. Some of them are very good at organizing it, they, can, they may listen very well, it's another possibility. 32% do it up to 19 hours. And then as you can see, there's a pretty sharp fall off. Essentially, nobody studies 40 hours or more in a given week. But what I want to point out here is that if you decided in your life space simply to study 20 hours, that puts you 
in the above 68 percent of your colleagues so you're in the top 30 percent of the class if you simply study as much as 20 hours during a week most of us when we're in school full-time can find 20 hours that isn't involved in class but there is time available if you want to make it available uh, to brighten yourself because you're only going to get one shot at this education this is the last time in your life when you have a dedicated chunk of free time at self-betterment take as much advantage of it as you can the opportunity is there but you've got to organize it to make sure that it happens and has the intended effect so as I said if you aim for 20 hours a week you're already studying more than two-thirds of the, the people that you're you're being educated with um, but that's just a, a figure to kind of keep in mind as, as a, an average load uh, that could be done I have had some I've asked some people to turn in the schedules at, at various times and some of the ways people spend time is absolutely fascinating. I remember one semester, a young lady uh, turned in a schedule that, that on, uh, I think if I remember, it was on Sunday, Monday, Tuesday, and Wednesday. It was all filled with date, uh, visiting Sam, and so forth and so on. Uh, Thursday morning, heartbreaking. 7, 8, 9 a.m. was uh, break up with Sam. <laughs> From 9.30, the rest of the day was go find new man. <laughs> so there are ways to control how we do our, our life, but I think this will be a good way to kind of catch the general spirit of what you're trying to, uh, what you're trying to accomplish. Um, let me also then, the other thing that I want to pull out of the, the book by uh, Morgan and Deese um, is a very valuable study technique that they propose, and it's been worked on as, as a technique. It's been studied at Cornell for years, uh, and they've pretty well perfected it now. Um, in essence, what it recommends is that there, is a, uh, there are several rubrics for this, but the most popular one by far is SQ3R. There's an SQ4R, there's an SP2R, and there are a variety of other things, but it still boils down to these same series of steps in general. Um, the number one thing that this system asks you to do is, is to perform each of these steps. When you've got to master a chapter, uh, what you're going to do, first of all, is to survey it. Now, don't forget to push the mic button, but there'll be some quiet time while I give you guys a chance to answer the question, what are some ways in which you can survey a chapter that you're about to read? What are some ways in which you could do that? And now I'm gonna be quiet, and we may just finish the tape with nothing but quiet, but if you'll offer an idea, I can work with it and shape some ideas for you. Think of some ways in which you can survey. Push the button and give me an idea. Um, you look through the chapter at the bullet points and just kind of read over and make kind of questions out of the bullet points? Yes, you can do it that way. You've, you've anticipated the next issue that I'm going to get to. But in fact, in just surveying, one possibility is just go through and, and look at the bullet points. Or uh, the word I would prefer to use is to look at the, the labels, uh, the chapter identifiers. Most academic texts are organized to give, they will give you what are called level C indicators. That is the, the center the center headings are A level, the, the left margin uh, section headings are B level, and the actual paragraph uh, starting bold words are the C level. So if you'll just read through, page through the chapter, I wouldn't even read through it, I would page through it, um, and then read just those bold headings. So that's one way to do it, is to page through the chapter. There's actually an even more efficient way to do it, and that is to read the table of contents. In most cases, either the table of contents will have a chapter uh, summary, sometimes for each chapter, right in there at the beginning. Other times, uh, our book, I believe, starts at the moment with a chapter outline at the beginning of the chapter. Um, the introductory text that I use starts with a paragraph that actually states in the first paragraph what's going to be covered in the whole book. But one way or another, what you need to do is to survey the material. That's the goal, a quick review of what you're going to be covering. Um, Secondly, what you then do is to use that to do the second step, which was in her first answer and very effectively integrated, and that is ask a question or two. If you're in college to learn, you ought to be in college to learn what you'd like to learn. Don't just let us passively pour stuff into you because we'll do it and then you'll graduate and somebody else will have to find the starter button for you. I think it's better to develop a set of, of your own questions that you're trying to answer and develop a career out of that. But ask a couple of questions. Two advantages of that seems kind of dumb, and it is quite easy, but its intent, is, its purpose is, first of all, it personalizes it for you. If you've looked at that survey and decided, you know, seen what's going to be offered, pull out of it what's best for you. So form that into a couple of questions. I mean, one suggestion was in the initial uh, response there, and that is you can, you can take the topics and turn them into questions. 
I would turn them into personal questions. That is, uh, by saying turn them into questions, ask questions that are important to you and see if you can dig out that information. So the, the one thing I would, I would suggest that you do is, is to um, ask a series of questions that, that are personally relevant. And the second thing is then that it, it gets you reading for particular content. Okay, you're searching for particular answers and the search function will lead you into more things than just simply passively passing the words through your, word, your mind one time. So you survey, you question. The third R is going to be reading. I've looked at a lot of formulas for how to master introductory text, texts and not a one of them has failed to involve reading. So one way or another, it's not going to be enough to just prop yourself up at supper and sit on the material. It won't enter that way, easily at least. Um, you're going to have to read it one way or another. And then immediately hard on the heels of that, what you need to do is to recite. That's really the key of how you learn when you're reading. And that is you read the material and then recite it. And now I'm going to surprise you. If we can open up the camera, I want to do a, a quick survey here. I'll give you three or four time ranges or ratios and ask the following question. If you think about a typical hour, kind of mid-October sometime, not getting ready for an exam, but just reading a chapter that you're responsible for. How would you split the time between reading and recitation? How many of you would split your time with a chapter 50-50? Say 30 minutes reading, 30 minutes reciting, but close doing some other kind of activity or outlining or something like that. Okay, we got a couple of takers. Let's go, let's see which direction. Let's go 40-20. Uh, 40 minutes of reading, 20 minutes of recitation, two to one as a ratio. Okay, got twice as many takers. How about three to one? 45 minutes of reading, 15 minutes of recitation. How many would go that far? Okay. How about four and one? And that's as far as I'll go. 12 minutes of reading, 48 minutes of rest, uh, reading. Yeah, that's right. 48 minutes of reading, 12 minutes of recitation. How many would go that far? Okay. Now let me go the other direction, see if I can keep it straight. 20 minutes of reading, 40 minutes of recitation. How many would do that? It's going to be a quick lecture. 15, let's do three to one. 15 minutes of, of reading, 45 minutes of recitation. How many would do that? Okay, a couple of more takers. And finally, the last one, four and one. Uh, uh, one and four, I should say. 12 minutes of reading, 48 minutes of recitation. How many would do that? That is the recommended ratio for mastery of new material in a freshman and sophomore level reading assignment. One and four, okay? So when we go into the, the, um, the words there, um, what I'm going to suggest is that typically one hour of reading should result in four hours of recitation. Okay, That is the key. And that balance, whatever you choose to strike, is what's going to really determine how well you master the material. The more time you spend reciting it up to the one to four ratio, the better you will master it. And what I mean by recitation, it can, it can take many different forms. It, it isn't like, you know, read, close the book um, and say back what you remember. You can do it in a lot of different ways. If you're outlining the book as you're reading, that's kind of an integration of both reading and recitation at the same time. But in the writing of the outline, you're actually doing that. If you're taking notes for yourself, that's another way to recite the material. You're pulling out what's most meaningful for you and putting it into another recorded fashion. You're still interacting with the material. So the purpose in the other side is, uh, is, is the, the output, the, the recitation, okay? I have a question for you. Think about when you take an, oh, let me finish this and then we get back to looking at each other. And that is the final element is review. That is, if, if you've done the reading and recitation, what that's saying is that the time at which you, re, you learn something is not during the review. What you're doing when you review is actually going back over what you've already learned during the reading and recitation and you're literally using the review just to fill in any missing chinks in your armor, okay? You just pull in the last justification for that statement and, and so forth and so on. Um, now, related to that, let's finish with the following, and that is think about a typical exam, any class, doesn't have to be this one, just any class. When you're taking an exam, what skills are you required to do? What actual skills do you have to demonstrate in an exam to get a grade? Think about it, and I'm looking at general level uh, descriptions of what I'm talking about. At the general level, what are the things that you're going to have to do if you had to list, say, two or three things to, to get a score on any exam in a class? What do you have to do? What, what kind of things are you expected to do? Give me a shot. If you Don't worry about the microphone. Just belt it out, and I'll just re-vocalize it here. Mumbling, mumbling, and I'm not hearing an answer. 
Just tell me by word what you'd have to do to get a, a good exam, a good exam grade. Uh, if it is an open book, I'm talking closed book here. Memorize. memorize is before doing the exam. You don't memorize in an exam. I heard the word at least a couple of times, recall. You have to recall the information. I don't care what, you're ta what exam you're taking, if you cannot recall the information, you have nothing to work with. So the number one act is recall. Once you've recalled the information, what do you have to do with it? What's the other key thing you have to do in an exam? Recall and then bingo, apply it, okay? So I don't care what course you're in, if you can't recall the relevant information and then apply it properly, you're lost. The one other thing I'm gonna suggest, because I think those are the only two things you absolutely have to do. The only other thing I'm gonna suggest is that if you think about it, um, we normally put ourselves in a high state of drive when we're taking an exam, okay? I had the tragedy of having a printing problem one time and I was late to an exam that was 50 minutes, you know, nine to 9.50, and I was in, not there till about 10. I've almost got lynched walking into the class. You know. We had 50 minutes to do this, and boy, it was pretty tense. Don't do that to yourself. We all do, but don't. Um, think about it. I mean, in this class, you're gonna take four exams and do a project. So any one exam is 20% of one three credit hour grade, and you're gonna take 42 classes. So if other instructors do roughly the same thing, an exam here is about one half of 1% of the content of what you're gonna be, of what's gonna determine your grade point ratio. Relax, no one exam is that intense. But in any case, I'm off target you end up having to recall and apply under conditions of self-generated pressure, and that determines a good exam. Of those three, are any of those input variables? I'll give you the answer, no. They're output variables. Recall, apply, and the conditions under which you do so are output variables. So why do you spend all your time getting ready for an exam by reading? That's an input process. That is not an output process. So when you read, yeah, you've got to do that. I'm not saying don't read. But what I'm saying is the, reading for the, the reason for that one to four ratio is you spend the time practicing. Because ultimately, in any exam, in any job, if the boss asks for what are we going to do about the shipping problem in Cleveland, if you don't open your mouth and have an answer, if you don't output, you get no score and no raise. So for exams, think in terms of output, not input. We'll pick it up there next time with a review of our topics. Thank you for coming.